We will now go on to study the posterior region. The infraspinatus muscle originates under the spine of the scapula in the infraspinous fossa. It is triangular, with its base located internally, and its fibers converge to form a thick tendon, which inserts on the oblique insertion surface of the greater tubercle of the trochita. The teres minor muscle originates from the infraspinous fossa along the superior half of the lateral border of the scapula. It runs along the lower border of the scapula and inserts on the greater tubercle behind the infraspinatus on a vertical bony surface. In order to obtain a fine sagittal view of the infraspinous fossa, let's start from the sagittal view of the supraspinous fossa that we looked at a minute ago. Then we move backwards over the spine of the scapula and we follow this beautiful bony slope that we see deep to the image and which corresponds to the floor of the infraspinous fossa. Superficially, we can observe the curve of the infraspinatus muscle located deep to the posterior bundle of the deltoid muscle. The following image is a long axis view of the muscle and the infraspinatus tendon. We started from the sagittal image. We swivel in an oblique horizontal plane which will follow the obliquity of the infraspinatus muscle. Then we will follow it traveling toward the scapulohumeral joint, which we will view in depth, then towards its insertion that we can see here on the greater tubercle of the humerus. In depth, we note the existence of that joint and of a hyperechogenic triangular labrum, which we can see here. When this horizontal view of the posterior glenohumeral joint is performed in neutral rotation or in medial rotation, the infraspinatus tendon is flattened against the joint. In order to achieve a more sensitive detection of an infusion, we can ask the patient to perform external rotations that relax the infraspinatus and the joint capsule. When that manoeuvre is carried out, we can observe, to the left of the image, a structure that dilates and retracts, which corresponds to the infraspinous vein inside the spinoglenoid notch. We will complete the exploration of the posterior region by an analysis of the teres minor and of its relations with the infraspinatus. On this very lateral sagittal image, we can rather easily evidence the oblique facet of the greater tubercle on which the infraspinatus inserts, and its vertical insertion facet on which the teres minor inserts under my arrow. We continue the exploration of the teres minor by moving the transducer, starting from our sagittal image of reference. In this favourable case, you can see that the subject shows a perfectly identifiable intramuscular aponeurosis, which can be easily differentiated from the overlying of the infraspinatus. The suprascapular nerve springs directly from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. It will then travel laterally along the deep surface of the trapezius. It will then go through the scapular notch and then the spinoglenoid notch onto the posterior aspect of the scapula. Let's revert in an axial plane to the spinoglenoid notch, where there is a vein of which the terminal branch of the suprascapular nerve is a satellite. If we travel upwards, still in an axial plane, following that pedicle along the deep surface of the infraspinatus muscle, we will see it go under the spine of the scapula. This is a blind zone. Then we will pick it up again in the supraspinous fossa, still in contact with the scapular bone, and follow it upwards as far as the suprascapular notch. The axillary nerve originates from the posterior bundle of the brachial plexus. It arises in the axillary cavity, travels laterally, then enters the lateral axillary space or quadrilateral space of Velpo. This quadrangular space is formed by the surgical neck of the humerus laterally, by the long head of the triceps medially, by the teres minor upwards, and the teres major downwards, it circles the posterior aspect of the surgical neck of the humerus and ends on the deep aspect of the deltoid. We will now attempt to evidence the axillary nerve at the level of the, of the quadrilateral space of Velpo. In order to do this, we locate the teres minor as on the previous images. On the immediately inferior part of the teres minor, which forms the roof of the quadrilateral space of Velpo, we individualize a neurovascular pedicle. With the triceps deep to it, all we need to do is turn around that pedicle to see it circle the diaphysis of the humerus. So here is the small artery. 
And here, probably, is the small nerve. We will end with an image of the auxiliary nerve. This time we will locate the auxiliary nerve on the lateral border of the diaphysis of the humerus. Here you can see the artery, and here the small nerve. And we will tilt this transducer by 90 degrees. We tilt the transducer in order to try to obtain the long axis view of the auxiliary nerve that you see here.